Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Ron Weiss. Dr. Weiss is the founder of Ethos Health, with Health, which is a collaborative healthcare project that joins a lifestyle focused primarily on medical care practice to a working organic farm. Dr. Weiss is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and assistant professor of clinical medicine at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. As an internist and an ER physician, for over 20 years, Dr. Weiss has integrated a plant-based diet within his traditional practice to improve the health of many thousands of his patients. He's worked in various settings, first as an internist at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and the Medical Group of Beverly Hills in Los Angeles, and then as an attending ER physician at UCLA Olive View Medical Center and the General Hospital Center of Passaic, and finally, as founder of a busy community medical center in West New York, New Jersey. Dr. Weiss received his medical degree from Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, and completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at George Washington University Medical Center. He holds a baccalaureate degrees in botany and music from Rutgers University, where he graduated magna cum laude and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Yes, he's a very smart guy. Uh, I like to call him Dr. Earth because he understands that our uh, Mother Earth can really keep us healthy. It is my pleasure to introduce and to present to you Dr. Ron Weiss. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming today. And thank you to the entire Nelson family for uh, putting on this wonderful program. I guess you could say that uh, I had a midlife crisis. By the time I reached my 40s, I'd had it up to here with the way I was practicing medicine. I was completely fed up with our American health medical care system. I was fed up with our industrialized food system. And most of all, I was scared. I was scared that our world was melting. By this time in life, I had two little children. And they're still little, they're eight and nine years old today, but back then they were toddlers. And I would look into their eyes and feel how much I loved them and was afraid that by the time they reached my age, the world would become a very inhospitable place for them to live in. So I was brought to the point where I chucked it all. I sold my established medical practice. I took all of my assets. And I bought a broken down old farm, much to the consternation of my dear wife, Deborah. <laughs> Today, I practice medicine right in the middle of this farm. We grow the medicines that restore the health of people and our surroundings. This is the world I came to tell you about today. That little guy is me. Took a couple of snapshots from our family album. Uh, I must have been about three and a half years old in that picture, standing in front of our brick Cape Cod house in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And um, soon after that, for my fourth birthday, my mother gave me the best birthday present I'd ever gotten in my life. It was a package of seeds, a little pack of four o'clock seeds. I don't know if any of you 
know what four o'clocks are. They're a very old-fashioned flower that people used to grow in the 19th century in Victorian time gardens. And that was because this flower opens every day at four o'clock. And my mother helped me put each of these little brown seeds into the soil. And a week later, four-year-old kid, I see these green sprouts coming out. A couple of months later, they turn into these beautiful plants with red and white and yellow and pink trumpet-like flowers. And every day I would go out at four o'clock and watch them open. I was hooked. Plants were the best thing in my world. A few years, few years later, all of the kids across the street were setting up lemonade stands, selling lemonade for 25 cents. So I figured I'd compete against them. I went around my backyard and dug up little maple tree seedlings, put them in paper cups, and set up my own little stand. Maple trees, 25 cents. <laughs> Never sold one. <laughs> but I was not deterred. Even my mother didn't buy one from me. <laughs> what was with that? <laughs> By the time I was a teenager, I decided I want to be a farmer, but there was a strong influence from my parents to become a doctor. So I became a pre-med. I went to Rutgers. And uh, I, as a compromise, I majored in botany, and I got a plant degree. I was pre-med and also a degree in piano performance. I then went on to uh, Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, got my MD degree, and then came down to Washington, D.C., home of Neil Barnard, to do my internal medicine residency. And here I am with my late 80s, early 90s poofy uh, haircut and I'm standing with my dad in front of GW Hospital a couple of blocks away from the White House. I was a junior resident then in internal medicine. Little did I know that about 18 months later our world would be turned upside down. Got a call from my father, 18 months later. I was actually here in LA uh, going to USC Film School for a graduate program in film production after I finished my residency. And we got a call that he'd been experiencing severe abdominal pain for a few weeks out of the blue. We took him to the doctor. He got a diagnosis of end-stage metastatic pancreatic cancer. I came home. Uh, we took him to the best cancer hospital in the world. And we met with not any doctor. We met with the head of the solid tumors department, division of pancreatic tumors. It was such a big hospital that they had heads for every kind of tumor within uh, an overall department. And this um, head of the department gave my father about 90 days to live, three months. My father was a smart man. He was an attorney, uh, 50 years his practice. He had been practicing, and he just decided to go home and prepare for death. The, what he was offered was 5-fluorouracil, which was the main treatment for pancreatic cancer, had an 85% no response rate, and a 15% chance that it could maybe shrink your tumor a, a little bit, not significantly, maybe give you another life, uh, never, another week or two left uh, to life. Mind you, today's treatment is not much different. 5-FU, this was 23, 24 years ago. 5-FU is still one of the main treatments for pancreatic cancers. Uh, today, Gemzar is the, is the main treatment because maybe it gives you three weeks extra. My father went home. 
I moved back home to help prepare him for death and take care of him. <laughs> and it was very hard for me to accept because I was a new doctor, right? I'd taken care of many pancreatic cancer patients at GW. I'd given them that 5-FU. I knew what happened to them. It didn't matter what you did for them. Everyone ended up dying within the year. So uh, I figured I just had to start looking for something, something outside my world, because I had nothing that I could do to help my father. So I went to the public library in town, in Fairlawn. And you have to remember, there was really not an internet yet. Couldn't really research things. And I just started looking through the bookshelves at weird things, you know, alternative medicine, you know, Leotril from Mexico, and shark cartilage, enemas, and Chinese herbs, and, uh, what else? You know, yoga, ashrams in India, we were going to send them to places in Ger East Germany and West Germany. And finally, I came across some books and I was reading about some people who ate special food and there were testimonials that they had done well. They had cancers. Some of them had cured them. And the book I was reading from proposed a kind of a whole foods plant-based diet, which was known and is known still today as the macrobiotic diet. Brought this home to my father, showed it to him. He had no choice. He accepted it. We brought him up to Boston, met with Michio Kushi, who, who was the, the leader of this movement. He just died this past winter and looked at my father's feet, told him he was eating too much chicken. Ah. <laughs> I didn't learn that in the physical exam section of medical school. <laughs> told my father to go home and place them on an extremely severe plant-based whole foods diet that would make each of us in this room blanch. This diet consisted of brown rice, seaweed, kale, some uh, cruciferous vegetables in general, carrots, uh, no nightshade uh, produce at all, no fruits, uh, a few mushrooms, some beans, and that's about it. My father began this diet. Now, you have to remember, pancreatic cancer is one of the most severely painful cancers that there is. We, he was, as he came home from Michio Kushi, he was still taking Percocets all the time. Could not go to the bathroom. Hadn't had a bowel movement in five days. We started this program, and within three days, uh, his abdominal pains were completely gone. Didn't need any painkillers at all. Mm. Having bowel movements every day. Now, he had begun to shut down his law office, but a week later he was back in his law office practicing law. Two weeks later he was back in the gym, exercising every day. Three weeks later, he was running two miles a day. Things get, get, kept just getting better and better and better with every passing week. Three months later, we got a CAT scan on him. Now, my father's tumors were widely metastatic. They were spread all over his abdomen. He had more tumor than liver left but from the metastases. At 90 days, the point where he was supposed to have been dead, the CAT scan showed a 30% reduction in all tumor masses. 
there's not a chemotherapy today that shows that generally gives any significant reduction. Nine months later, we got another CAT scan on him, showed a 50% reduction in all tumor masses. One year later, he was doing so well, we brought him back to that cancer hospital and met with the head of the department. We were trying to see maybe there was some new development, maybe some protocol that had been, you know, experimental drug or chemo had come out to help. Uh, and we walked into the visit. And when this doctor, the doctor that had initially seen my father, saw him now, he was startled. And he started questioning him, you know, wanting to know, like, why were you still alive? <laughs> my father started talking about seaweed, <laughs> brown rice, kale, you know, broccoli, and the doctor's eyes rolled up. A screen descended between us, like a partition. Changed the conversation. They didn't want any more information from my father. That's the moment that changed me as a doctor. My father did not live three months. He lived 18 months. And he had such an excellent quality of life during most of that time, better than he had 30 years previous to that. He practiced law, which is what he loved to do, in a really bad neighborhood, crime-ridden neighborhood in Patterson, New Jersey, until two weeks before he died. After he passed, I moved out of the house I grew up in. And as I was unpacking my boxes, I pulled out my New Jersey Medical School diploma and I looked at it. On the New Jersey Medical School diploma, there's a beautiful golden embossed seal of, of the medical school. And in the center, there's an image of Hippocrates standing next to the staff of Asclepius. You know, that stick with a snake around it. And as I was looking at that, I realized, you know what? I know I took the oath of Hippocrates when I got the diploma. I know he's an important guy. He, I heard that he was the father of Western medical thought. But nobody had ever taught me anything about him in medical school. Not one word. His name was never mentioned. They just gave me a diploma with his picture on it. So I figured, let me look this guy up. And I read about him. And I learned that his prime tenet was that food is the most powerful medicine. So, I sell off all my assets, I sell my practice, and I buy this place. <clears throat> I was in trouble. <laughs> I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a poor businessman. And I figured, let me get some help, some advisors. So, uh, it's a, a startup, I don't have a lot of money. I decided to go to my old alma mater, Rutgers, has an excellent graduate business school in Newark. I went to the Rutgers MBA program, and they have a program where they will help, you know, start up businesses for free. They'll be your business advisors, write up a business plan, you know, and help you. And when they heard what I was doing, they liked it so much that the entire graduate school climbed on board and said, we'll help you, we'll advise you, we'll tell you what to do. The first thing they said was, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> You're a doctor, and you sold your practice, and you're going into a farm? Why is that? And I told them, because how fantastic plants are for reversing and preventing illness. 
And they said, well, that's interesting. Okay, we'll believe you. Never heard of it before. We'll believe you, but we don't understand why you're on a farm. I mean, this is in northern New Jersey, an hour from Manhattan. You just spent all of your money buying all this dirt. Why don't you just be a doctor, be in a medical office, rent a, a, an office in the medical arts building in downtown, and people will come to you and you'll help them. Why? We don't get it. Why a farm? And I told them, because it's not just the food. It's that world that the food comes from. Food and the way food is grown are critical determinants of human health and the health of the world around us. Take a look at this picture. We all enjoyed some hot oatmeal this morning, yes? Here it is growing in our field with Schoolies Mountain in, in the background. So the oats are ripening in the morning sun early in July. Another two weeks after this, we will cut these oats, harvest them, and we'll eat them. But it's just not a field of oats. It would be in conventional farming. But here, you have to remember something. We always have to maintain those connections to the world around us. We can't plant things into the ground, expect them to grow food for us, take the food and then rob the soil and the earth of its materials. Conventionally, that's what happens. And then you have to spray chemicals to try and support the successive crops. But here, we planted a cover crop of oats combined with red clover. After we harvest those oats, you'll see the green bed of green clover coming out. The clover does two things. Its roots reach down six feet, taller than I am, into the soil, loosens up the compaction of the soil that kills the, the, the beautiful life in the soil. And at the same time, the roots fix nitrogen, which is essential fertilizer to grow plants, put it back into the soil. So after we grow this and then let it rest and let those beautiful clover plants do their job, the next year we can grow these in the same place. These are some of our fantastic heirloom tomatoes. And that photo is not retouched or recolored. That color, that vibrating color, that's, those are special molecules in those tomatoes we're going to learn about later. We all hear this saying a lot, right? You are what you eat. But when I see this, I really think of it extremely concretely. You know, when we eat this tomato, we become that tomato. Human beings take the universe around them into ourselves through our GI tract. The un whatever coming in, the, the un universe is broken down, then, then distributed through us. For example, I take a bite of one of these tomatoes, I chew it into chunks, I swallow it, goes down my esophagus, plops into my stomach, dissolves into a pool of acid, it turns into a slurry, enzymes then act upon it, it's broken down even into two tomato molecules. Those tomato molecules diffuse through my amazing and very special GI lining we're going to find out about later. Goes into the bloodstream then our bodies assemble those molecules into us. We are tomatoes. But let's go back really, really far. Because originally we are stardust. This is, these are pictures from our Hubble telescope that show stars being born in our universe. The human body is made out of seven times 10 to the 27 atoms. That's 
a billion, billion, billion atoms, give or take one or two atoms. 60% of those atoms came from the Big Bang 14 billion years ago. The atoms within us, they can be traced back to the Big Bang. The rest of them are all kinds of, you know, the, of the other elements. They are iron, you know, magnesium, calcium, and they came from the birth of our star, our sun, and our earth. They were born about the same time. Those atoms coalesced into a ball, our planet Earth, and there that ball sat for probably almost a billion years before it started to develop a thin skin on it of this. This inert ball made out of those atoms that were born out of the explosion that created the sun and our, our earth developed, eroded away and developed this skin of material and inside this material life began to grow. And it is our soil. Soil is very special. One tablespoon of a good soil has at least three billion lives in it. 70 to 80 percent of these lives we haven't even identified yet. We, they don't have any genus or species classifications. We don't know what they are. But as you're going to see, they are critical to the production of good food and critical to maintaining our health. Here you see a kidney bean, okay, sprouting out of a beautifully humus-rich soil that is the product of death, right? Humus comes from compost. We take dying organisms, turn them into soil, and then it creates life. Anybody know about Wendell Berry? I'll give you some homework to do. Read his poem, The Peace of Wild Things. He's a great American writer, farmer, and an environmentalist. And he said this about the soil. The soil is the great connector of lives, the source and destination of all. It is the healer and restorer and resurrector by which disease passes into health, age into youth, and death into life. But there's a problem underfoot. In the 20th century, mankind has abandoned thousands of years of accumulated agricultural wisdom and custom and on a wholesale basis replaced it with chemical-based agriculture. This chemical-based agriculture has completely ignored what is going on in the soil. Not only ignored it, but has used weapons to kill the life of the soil. There's now great concern by many scientists about the numbers and the information that have been issued in this report. Our U.S. Department of Agriculture, little known to many people, has been measuring nutrient levels and compiling this data in uh, their reports for about, well, now over 100 years. This is the last one that came out in the year 2000. And the disturbing findings are that since the mid-20th century, when we pretty much began using chemicals on our soil, that most of our major crops, the nutrient context, the content has dropped by sometimes up to 40 to 50 percent nationally on average, depending on the crop, like carrots, broccoli, so on and so forth. It is now thought by the leading experts that this is because our soils have been damaged and destroyed.
When I saw this, uh, I think you can understand why I was fearful <laughs> in middle life. This person, believe it or not, is a farmer. This is a conventional farmer. This conventional farmer is pouring pesticide made by the DuPont company into his giant tractor. When I look at this picture, I think, if that chemical does not kill off every last living thing in the soil that that tractor is driving over, then whatever is left is going to be crushed to death by, the, by those tires. You know, you have to remember, soils do not like heavy things driving over them. How many of you have read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring? Please go and read it. Silent Spring first came out the spring that I was born. I sometimes think that maybe that was not coincidental. Silent Spring became a toxin, no pun intended, that's T-O-C-S-I-N, toxin. It means an alarm, an alarm bell that was heard around the world. This book was translated into many, many different languages. And basically, it formed the foundation for our mo modern environmental movement. This book is considered responsible for basically uh, pushing our government to form the Environmental Protection Agency, which was done under the Nixon administration in 1970. In the foreword, Rachel Carson uses this quote by Albert Schweitzer, the great physician and Nobel Prize winner. Man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. He will end by destroying the world. Rachel Carson's book was prompted by the development of DDT. For those of us who are not old enough to remember, DDT uh, is a very bad chemical. It was used as a pesticide. It was developed around World War II. By the time I was five years old, DDT had almost extinguished the symbol of our country, right? The bald eagle. It almost caused it to go extinct. There were only 400 nesting pairs left in the entire continental United States just because of DDT alone. When DDT was developed just after World War II, there were a half a million pounds of all pesticides uh, being used in the United States. Last year, one billion, that's billion with a B, pounds of Roundup alone was poured on American soils and into our rivers, lakes, and environment. It's gotten to the point where the U.S. Geologic Survey now measures Roundup levels in our rain. It is raining Roundup. And that's just one chemical. In Silent Spring, Rachel Carson took all these chemicals, the, whether they be herbicides that are killing weeds, fungicides that are killing fungus, pesticides that are killing insecticides, killing bugs. She labeled them as biocides because she talked about in Silent Spring how all life is connected. You cannot engineer one molecule to take out one organism, when you do that, it takes out all organisms. They're general biocides, life killers. 
So remember, just as you eat that tomato, that beautiful tomato, when you eat something else that has these pesticides on it, those pesticides go into you and those pesticide molecules become you too. The pesticide studies that have been centered on the farm community of Salinas, California are very well known. And we now know that farm workers' children in Salinas have pest, I'm sorry, I'm gonna call them biocides from now on. They have biocides running through them. But this was a very startling study. For the first time, uh, this study looked at children that are not shouldn't be exposed to directly to biocides. These children are urban children and suburban children who are not near farms. Yes, they do have, they do have access or exposure to chemicals, right? Because maybe their father sprays Roundup or some other you know, weed killer on the lawn or maybe they had cockroaches, they live in an inner city and someone sprayed like an insecticide to kill the cockroaches. But the amazing thing about this study is it proves that in those small amounts, even the casual exposures to environmental exposures to pesticides did not affect us. What did affect us were the biocides and the food we were eating. These red graphs show the levels of many, many different biocides, you know, pesticides, fungicides, insecticides that were urinated out by these children. They were swimming in this stuff. Look what happened. And this, they monitored these children for an entire year for 10 days, five days here and five days here, these children were given organic food to eat. The levels of these chemicals were near or at zero in their urine. <laughs> this advertisement appeared in Time magazine in 1947 when DDT was first um, introduced. This is what started Rachel Carson's work. It was thought to be a boon for mankind. Here's the advertisement, and you know, it says, oh yeah, grow giant apples, juicy, you know, you can get more of them. The farmer can grow you so many potatoes that, you know, the potatoes will be cheaper. It's gonna be cheap food. About a month ago, our farm manager, Nora, told me a story. In New Jersey, you know, we're known as the Garden State. Um, Rutgers is the land-grant institution, and uh, they do a lot of agricultural research, but almost none of it that you can see is sustainable. It's all supported mostly by industrial food systems and chemical companies. So every year they have, you know, what vegetable is New Jersey known for most? The Jersey tomato, right? So Rutgers through its Snyder Research Farm, it's a 400 acre farm, which is big for New Jersey, not too far down the road from our farm. And every August they have a, the New Jersey tomato festival. So she tells me she goes to this farm, and when you step on the farm, you know, it's a showcase farm. 400 acres, everything grown, perfect. Not a blade of grass at a place, not a weed, all rows cultivated, just everything. You don't see anything. Every plant is perfect. There are huge tomatoes, like the size of grapefruits, hanging from every single plant. And then they give you all the varieties to taste, 100 or so varieties. It's a tomato taste test. They're chopped up, they're on dishes in the tomato, on the table, taste testing table. 
upon tasting these tomatoes, she said they were completely flavorless. They had no aroma. They could, didn't taste like any. They tasted like some of those plastic tomatoes you get in the store. One did not taste any different than the other. In Silent Spring, Rachel Carson said, if we are going to live so intimately with these chemicals, eating and drinking them, taking them into the very marrow of our bones, we had better know something about their nature and their power. How prophetic. Okay. 1947, Time Magazine. 1962. This is Time Magazine today. This cover story shocked a lot of people who'd always thought that we are what we are because our DNA, which is like our, their, their DNA contains genes which are our instruction manuals. It tells our body and our cells how to make us and how to build us. That this is not the most important thing that makes us what we are. This field is called epigenetics. Epi meaning on top of, and genetics meaning genes. So it's not necessarily the genes that you inherited from your mother and father that make you what you are. I mean, that is there, but there are environmental influences now that Michael Skinner has done research on. And these environmental influences that he has done research are on are vinclozolin, which is a major fungicide used on a lot of the food that we eat, in addition to other insecticides and pesticides and plastics like BPA. And what we now know from his work is that these molecules can climb onto our DNA and methylate them. Methylations are like straitjackets of our DNA. And it's still the DNA from our parents, but it will control the DNA and make it do things which is not necessarily good for us. Some of these things are now known to be cancer, attention deficit disorder, autism, endocrine disruption, infertility. And the scariest part is that it doesn't necessarily happen to us, the effects of these epigenetics. It can happen to our grandchildren. So if I'm eating a pomegranate and it was sp sprayed with a fungicide vinclozolin, nothing may happen to me. But when I procreate, those straight-jacketed methylations will be travel down my DNA to my child's DNA and then to my grandchild's DNA and it can cause the mutation in him. There's not a type of genetic mutation known, including some of the mutations that you've heard about, like BRCA perhaps, the breast cancer gene mutation. There's not a type of genetic mutation known that's not potentially influenced by environmental epigenetic effects. Rachel Carson died at age 56 of breast cancer, two years after her book came out. A year before her death, she said this. How prophetic, given that this was, this is 50 years ago, and think how applicable it is today. Man's attitude toward nature is today critically important, simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and destroy nature. Now I truly believe that we in this generation must come to terms with nature, and I think we are challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, 
to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. So, if I'm to grow food, must I use these chemicals to produce food? The answer is absolutely not. And the reason why is because in all things, beautiful and perfect, designed by Mother Nature, Mother Nature takes into account all the connections. Mother Nature has designed plants to fight their own battles if they have access to the right things. Soil! Plants are designed to fight their own battles. They don't need chemicals if they're grown correctly. Let's look at this little diagram you might see in an eighth grade science class. We've probably seen it before. Here's our beautiful plant. Think what it does for us, right? It takes in the sunshine from above, sucks in carbon from our air, right? Takes up water from the ground, from the soil and its roots, throws in its own chlorophyll and makes sugar. It's a sugar factory, food, carbohydrate. And then releases oxygen for us to breathe. It's a good deal. Now, for a long time, we, we, we've known plants are sugar factories, right? They photosynthesize. But it wasn't until fairly recent times that we were shocked to find out what, what plants were doing with that sugar. Does anyone know what they do with the majority of their product that they're making? They're throwing it out into the soil. And this is why I say plants are farmers. Plants are farming. Plants are managing the billions of those little organisms in the soil which are so critical. Those organisms are the farm workers for the plant. The plant organizes, communicates with them, sometimes in very intimate ways that we were finding out, and feeds them, pays them with its sugar to go get the minerals that from the stardust, remember? All the stuff in the soil, it can't get itself, right? It's, it's in one place. It needs all these organisms to get it for it. The organisms bring it to the tiny little root hairs. These zones are called rhizospheres. It's the place of interaction between the life in the soil and the plant. And then the plant takes them up and builds itself with these elements. So that process, that whole process, is called primary plant metabolism, right? plant assembles all these atoms and all this, these elements from the soil and builds itself. It basically ensures the plant will live. But just like us, just like if you eat bacon and eggs, you'll live, but will you live well, right? Not necessarily. The plant needs more than this to live really healthy and successfully. And this is where the secondary plant compounds come in. Now, these compounds have many names. They call them plant, this is, sounds complicated, plant secondary, just remember the name secondary. Secondary compounds or, or secondary metabolites. Uh, another name is flavonoids. You know, you can go into GNC or the vitamin shop and buy a bottle of flavonoids. They're very high-end plant molecules. And if the plant can survive long enough, it will get to the level that it can make these flavonoids, these plant chemicals. These plant chemicals are the plants, uh, use it, the plant uses it to address environmental challenges. You know, a plant doesn't have feet. It can't run away from its enemies. It can't, doesn't have hands. It can't pick up a stick and hit a bug over the head with it. Mother Nature designed plants 
to build these chemical weapons called flavonoids. flavonoids. And they use these weapons to kill bugs. They use these weapons to um, kill fungus. They use these weapons, these flavonoids, to prevent insect chewing bugs from chewing their leaves to death. They use them in very sophisticated ways. We're, not, we're just beginning to understand this process. And here's the thing about them. The plants will not make them in sufficient quantities if they do not have a very intact soil. Number one. Number two, when you spray biocides, pesticides, on a farm field and you knock off all the bugs, the plants sit back and say, oh, I don't have any work to do. Why should I make these expensive and re really hard to make chemicals? No one's attacking me. Lastly, these flavonoids, mankind has evolved with for millions of years, and we now know that they, we are intimately linked to them as the molecular basis of our health. Now, just so that you're aware, Remember, I said that these secondary compounds, they're responsible for the plant, because the plant can't run or they can't, it can't hit like an animal can. They're responsible for, the plant uses it to meet its environmental challenges. So that is, you know, if it's being attacked, that's an environmental challenge. But another one is, you know, you have to remember, it can't walk over to someone and have sex with another plant. You know, it may need to, make a beautiful aroma, right, to attract a pollinator to itself so that the pollinator can, you know, uh, help it in the sexual act to, re to procreate. Some of these molecules are for that. It may, some of these secondary plant molecules may be involved in flavor, right? Remember that Rutgers Snyder station, no flavor? Because what animal would, who's job it is to disperse seeds would want to eat something that has no flavor. It puts flavors in these foods. It puts colors. Here you see these, the brilliant colors that only produce has. Those are those secondary plant, con plant molecules. Uh, um, animals that are eating these vegetables will be attracted by their colors. Let's digress for a moment. I want to talk about cancers. Each of us sitting in this room, if we are over the age of 20 years, we have cancers within us, and probably many of them. We didn't understand this in the old days, like 20 or so years ago when my father was battling his cancer. This was not clear to us. We thought, well, you know, maybe you're going along in life and then a cancer tumor pops up, your immune system kills it off. But we know that's not true now, and we know it from autopsy studies. We know that about 40% of all women, by the time they reach middle age, 40, have breast cancer. We know it because we've done autopsies on the women who, who died in car accidents and of other causes. We see it. We know that by the time a human, otherwise healthy human being reaches the age of 70, almost 100% of us have thyroid cancers within us. So the question is, these tumors are there, but they're very tiny, and they're just sitting there hibernating. What makes them explode, grow? metastasize, kill us. Without angiogenesis, a tumor will only grow to be the size of that ballpoint pen tip. So it was the work of Judah Falkman, a doctor at Harvard Medical School, who would have won the Nobel Prize in medicine for his work, who discovered this. 
And the reason why I say would have is because he died of a massive heart attack on the way in Vancouver Airport, on the way to delivering his speech, right? Something that we know from Dr. Benny is what? 100% preventable. He figured this out. That that little tumor up there that sits in all of us will just sit there doing nothing and we'll be safe with it as long as it's not prompted to suddenly do this. It starts to elaborate or emit these angiogenic factors, otherwise known as VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. There's a, there are little hormones that all of a sudden make blood supply grow, capillaries grow towards the tumors. Basically, these tumors can't go anywhere because they have no supplies, right? No blood supply, no nutrients, until the tumors start emitting these hormones that hijack our blood supply. The blood supply grows into the tumor and now the tumors have all the food they want and they can disperse themselves through our circulation and end up all over us, killing us. So, the major chemo agents that are used today are based on this work. That's why he would have won the Nobel Prize had he not died of sudden death from a heart attack. And the chemo agents block this from happening. They block these uh, hormones that cause the sprouting. That's why they're called anti-angiogenesis, anti-blood vessel growers. But guess what? The most powerful anti-angiogenesis factors are vegetables and fruits. It's veggies versus VEGF. Veggies always win. And guess what molecules those are? They are our friends, the secondary plant metabolites to the rescue. Those molecules that we evolved eating over millions of years. Not only are the plants using them to fight their diseases, but we use them to prevent these tumors from growing. Now, these specific compounds, I know this may be a little boring to people who don't have an organic chemistry background, but if you notice, see those hex hexagonal structures? Those are called aromatic rings. They smell, they're perfumes, they're tastes. This is what perfumes are made out of and tastes and flavors are made out of. So these are the molecules that are flavoring our vegetables and foods and giving us our colors. They're those, those secondary compounds. And we've isolated several thousand of them so far. Many of them are known to be these anti-blood vessel growing molecules. We estimate that there may be as many as 50 to 60,000 we have not discovered yet, just to show you how wide ranging this world is. Is this the same as phytochemicals? Yes, it is phytochemicals. Phyto meaning plant, chemicals, well, we know what that is. So I'm going to show you what happens when we just take, oops, when we take. Um, two of these little phytochemicals, luteolin from green peppers and apigenin from celery, and drip it on some um, sprouting capillaries. Now, you know, I think all of us who are, deal with nutrition every day, we all know that there's some whole plant foods that are you know, they're stars, right? Like kale. How can you beat kale? You know, you eat a piece of celery. How does that measure up to kale? When you look at it, the, the nutrients in kale are, you know, so over the top. Celery, what does it have in it? Well, it has this in it. 
Apigenin is, is just one of these molecules. So I just want to make you aware, kale does not have much apigenin in it. Just because we have not found what is in these plants, it doesn't mean that these plants do not have very valuable flavonoids. So over here, these are microscope slides of normal blood vessel tissues, capillaries. And you can see these tiny little things under a microscope or in the tissue, they're capillaries. Right? This is what capillaries look like under a microscope, normal. What happens if we sprinkle some VEGF? Okay, those, the terrible hijacking hormone that little tumors make. distortion. Capillaries start to grow. They're growing towards the tumor. Let's pour some extract from a celery plant on top of this dish. Reverts back to normal. The capillaries shrink away. When I saw this, I finally realized maybe that's why my father's tumors shrunk. Right? Come on. H how many nutrients does a green pepper have? It's not a star, right? Well, it has luteolin, this one compound. If you make a slurry, and a green pepper extract, you take the normal capillaries, pour VEGF, which makes the capillary sprout towards the tumor. There, here you go. Sprouting capillaries growing to feed our tumors pour a green pepper extract on it, reverts to normal. So here's the amazing thing. Just as the biocides can change who we are in a bad way, our friends that we evolved with always change us in a good way. These molecules act to change us many times through epigenetics. We now know that these molecules come into us through our intestine, they diffuse out through us, and they combine with our GNA to bring out our best potential. Here's some examples of what I'm talking about. For many years, we know or we knew that there were immune sentries guarding our, the lining of our intestines. Now, if you remember, the whole world comes in through our intestines, right? This is a dangerous place. You don't want everything coming into our body. What happens if there's a poison or a virus? We have to have guards down there that are going to protect us. And these guards are called lymphocytes. And for many years, we've known that there are uh, receptors that turn on these lymphocytes and get them to act for us and protect us. But we did not know what the, key, the molecule was or the key that fit into this receptor or keyhole that turned on the um, a function of these lymphocytes until in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a few years ago, it was reported that a molecule in broccoli, and, and broccoli's cruciferous cousins, it's all in all of them, is that key. One specific molecule, it is found nowhere else on earth. It is only in these plants. And it is so important that it was said that cruciferous vegetables are required. They're just not important, they are required for us to have a healthy gut. Because if we don't take in these molecules, these secondary plant metabolites, from these plants, how are our uh, immune guards going to be awoken, awakened, right? And we now know that these cruciferous molecules 
They work through epigenetics to bring out the best in our DNA. Punicalogen is a molecule, one of those thousands of molecules. It is only found, only place in the earth it is found is in pomegranate. You know, for the past two days, we've been talking about a, a lot about atherosclerosis, arteries clogging up, right? Well, we know that eating saturated fats and a lot of bad foods clog up our arteries, but there are other actors too. There's sheer stress. So just like designers of airplanes or cars put their model in a wind tunnel to see how they, they, they can best design the car to avoid the forces of stress from wind, we have sheer stress forces uh, in the rapidly flowing blood in our arteries that hit the walls, our, endo, our delicate endothelium, the lining of our arteries, and if it hits incorrectly or in a, a stressful way, it will cause damage to the endothelial and then, you know, atherosclerosis will develop, you'll get clogs. We now know that punicalogen, that plant flavonoid, phytochemical, secondary metabolite, whatever you want to call it, goes into our DNA and restructures things to make our endothelial cells respond to reduce the effects of shear stress. Now, I must apologize. I'm going to have to correct this slide because there's a small error in it. I'll show you in a moment. How many of us here think that eating soy is good for breast cancer. How many think that eating soy is bad or may be bad for breast cancer? Okay. It's good for breast cancer. It prevents breast cancer and it treats breast cancer. Here it is. There are at least three major studies that have been done in the past decade that demonstrate this. And what I'm going to ask you to please um, ignore is uh, without soy and with soy intake. So this graph takes a population of American women, let's say. All of them get diagnosed with breast cancer. So, and it follows them out for 60 months. That's five years. If you've survived after five years with a diagnosis of cancer, any cancer, you're considered cured, right? You have to wait that long to prove that the cancer is not going to reemerge. So that's why it's continued out to six months. Once we get to, uh, I'm sorry, 60 months, once we get to that point, whew, we know we're home free. Here's the percentage of women who are surviving at every point during the 60 months. We start off with 100% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, all kinds of breast cancer, you know, late breast cancer, early breast cancer, little breast cancers, all kinds of treatments, it doesn't matter, radiation, um, uh, lumpectomy, mastectomy, chemotherapy, everyone is thrown in here. This top line is the survival of women, mm, let's say near 85%, of the women who have the equivalent of one glass of soy milk a day. This survival line at about 50% is the women who have no or the least soy. That's just from a glass of soy milk a day. So if you don't have any soy, you have a 50% chance of being alive in five years. If you have a glass of soy, you have a 85% chance of being alive. Even eating hot dogs, hamburgers, bacon, a soybean, right? Why? Epigenetics. On that molecular chart, we showed a soybean, and one of those molecules that soybeans are known for is called genistein. And a genistein is, is the thing that everybody is afraid of. 
that it's a phytoestrogen, right? That it's, a, it's an estrogen-like plant molecule and everyone's been taught that, oh, breast cancers are fueled by estrogen. You don't want estrogen. But we now know that the way genistein acts is it comes to our BRCA. Everyone knows what BRCA is? BRCA is that gene that was you know, popularized in the lay press by Angelina Jolie. BRCA is a good thing to have, okay? She did not have it. She had a mutation of her BRCA. Her BRCA gene wasn't working. BRCA genes suppress and kill off breast cancers. You want them. Shh. There was a problem with hers, and that's why she had a mastectomy, but she didn't want to get breast cancer. We now know that genistein goes to our DNA and unlocks these straight-jacketed methylations that have been placed there by environmental factors, maybe pesticides, right? Unlocks them and allows our B good BRCA gene to do its job and kill breast cancer cells. That would explain the difference in survival in that last graph. Now I think we can pretty clearly understand the great Colin Campbell's statement that nutrition acts not by one, but by a symphony of mechanisms. You've heard that symphony today, right? And it all comes from plants plants and their molecules. It's not, oh, where do you get your protein from, right? Where's your protein? It's not about where you're getting your protein from. It's about this world that swirls around us and who makes us what we are. And it is a whole plant foods that act through that symphony of mechanisms to thwart a constellation of human illness. And this is why unrefined plant foods are so powerful in preventing and reversing disease because they work through a symphony. It's not like a protein, where do you get your protein from? It's one protein. It's doing things we haven't even discovered yet. And they're all coordinated by millions of years of evolution and co-development. And this is why I will take a whole plant foods diet any day and use it to treat a patient versus a pill. A pill is a single molecule which has been magnified millions of times over that pinpoints one biochemical equation, right? It may set off other chains of events and that are undesirable, but it cannot, it, it may somehow address one aspect of one disease, but plants, through their coordinated orchestration, just fixes us. And I wanted to share with you some examples across a broad spectrum of patients that we have in our practice just to describe to you how wide-ranging this power is. Ninety, Ninety years old, right? At the end of life, who, who could help this person? Ninety-year-old lady comes to me the night before Christmas, the, eve, the night before the Christmas Eve, at 90 years of age. She's in the office in florid heart failure. That means that her lungs are filling up with fluid. Okay? I do a chest x-ray on her. Half of her lungs are filled up with fluid. She can't breathe. Her daughter, who's middle-aged, wheels her in a wheelchair. She's a diabetic. She's hypertensive. She's in heart failure. And she's been on drugs for like 20 years. And 
you know, I know the knee-jerk reaction would be, let's call 911 when she can't breathe. And I presented the, the choice to her. You know, I could call 911, uh, and, but I know what's going to happen to you. you. You know, you're 90 years old and your life's going to be over because people who go into the heart, into the emergency room, having been an emergency room doctor, who are 90 years old, who are in heart failure, it, there's a very small chance that they're going to come out. They're probably going to die in the hospital. And if they don't die immediately, they're going to die of some secondary problem like pneumonia in the hospital. They're going to fall in the hospital. Something is going to happen. I said, listen, you know, plants work through a symphony of mechanisms. It's just not giving you Lasix to get the fluid out. They work through a world that is so comprehensive. If I sent you home right now, I could tell you what to eat. I'd write it down for you. Your daughter could go to the supermarket, get it. You decide. I can send you right home. I'll tell you what to do. Just eat the food as medicine. Otherwise, I got to call the ambulance. The mother was kind of halfway out of it. The daughter decided for her. She said, we'll take the food. They went home. I had to stop all of their medicines within a day. Uh, and, you know, th this was like an emergency case. It was so severe, I didn't, you know, I did have to get the fluid out of her lungs first because she could not breathe. And so I was reluctant to take off some of that diuretic, that Lasix, but I did after three days, it was gone, and actually she had taken it too long because she got too dried out <laughs> from taking it. She walked into my office a week later with a walker, not in a wheelchair. That was almost three years ago. Today, she's 93. She just turned 93. And she walks about town. She does the family's laundry. She knits. And she enjoys her life. She does not have diabetes anymore. She does not have high blood pressure. She is not on heart medicine. She is not on, she's not on any pills at all. That's the symphony playing. And it plays for people who have enlarged prostates and who have had asthma since childhood and who have acne, who, you know, have no help available and rheumatoid arthritis for years. All of these can be reversed by this symphony. This is a picture we took in our sweet potato field. This is, you know, that symphony of mechanisms is just a microcosm of the symphony of connections in our entire life. And as we were growing those sweet potatoes in this beautiful field, this mommy snapping turtle came to lay her eggs. And so that was in June. This was in September. So we not only had our sweet potatoes, but we had baby turtles. And we're reminded uh, of Rachel Carson, Carson's admonition, right? That we are all connected. We should remember that. So I'm going to end with some snapshots of our farm. And... Um, there's time, I will take questions.